Yeah, welcome back. Uh, we will uh, just slide into meditative awareness. So if you make yourself comfortable taking your seat, we'll take a moment uh, to connect with the others on the call, or a sense of togetherness, People coming together with the same kind of longing and the same kind of questions, the same kind of struggles, human beings with feelings. And uh, maybe even with the sense that we are doing this healing work uh, for the benefit of all. So with the, with the wish, the deep wish to uh, be more beneficial or for yourself or for the people around you and for the earth. And uh, most uh, spiritual traditions they point uh, to the insight that we struggle so much in life and we bring so much struggle for the people around us and for the earth because, uh, because of a distortion of reality. So we are not in touch with reality. We live in a hallucination in them. We don't see ourselves and the people around us, how they really exist. So we live in our projections. And it's really uh, inspiring to be together with people who uh, want to go, uh, who want to look at the root of this. What's the root of war and climate change? And what's the root of that? The fundamental cause. Yeah, and the fundamental cause is greed and exaggerated attachment. But there is a deeper cause for greed and exaggerated attachment, and that is the identification with an I, with a me. And what we want to discover in this course is that this separate, solid I, me, does not exist. It's unfindable. It 
and not only want we uh, want we want we we not only want to understand that intellectually, but experientially. And when that illusion is looked through, something magical beautifully happens and your heart opens completely. And the light inside shines through and the, the intelligence shines through, your goodness shines through. So the inner light, Buddha nature, is covered up. And uh, looking through the illusion of a separate solid me, removes these veils. and a deep inner healing process happens. So uh, like yesterday, we will start with shifting into the aliveness of our body. So you adjust your posture. And at one point your eyes want, might want to close. You can also, of course, sit with open eyes with a relaxed gaze. That feels more appropriate for you. And uh, take this precious moment to connect with your inner life as it is. There's a sense of sliding or dropping away from the head, away from the in a dialogue, into being, into beingness, being here, and being who you are. Again, a light, Resting with the in and out flow of the breath. And with the in breaths, a deeper dropping, sliding even into your legs and your feet and the trunk of your body into your arms and hands. Present moment awareness. Uh, such a simple, effortless, but so fundamental Buddhist practice. Present moment awareness. What is here? What do you feel? What do you sense? What do you hear?
And the invitation here is to do this or to be here in a non-controlling, non-interfering, non-fixing, non-doing way. This moment is a mystery. Aliveness is a mystery. Being aware is a mystery. It's a gift you're receiving right now. It's a bit counter instinctual not to do anything. But that's the invitation here. Arriving at your own door and meeting yourself as a, your best friend. And meeting yourself means meeting what you experience, what you feel. the energy in your body, the inner weather. And in this gesture, we are together. So we're doing this for each other also. It's the gesture of welcoming, of embracing, of letting the experience be as it is, softening and opening. In the belly, in the shoulders, in the face. There's the possibility again and again to drop all concepts and all words. Because this moment just happens. You don't need to add to it, you don't need to take away. Meditating with the heart like the sky. Sliding was sinking deeper. A bit like if you imagine this moment as a shoreless ocean, the shoreless ocean of life. And most of the time you are stuck in the waves of the conceptual mind. And now you let go and you drop into the depth. And allow the breath to flow. If it wants to come, become a bit deeper, you allow that to happen. Sometimes there's also a bit of a sighting, maybe. Or well, you notice that your breath becomes very, very subtle. And in a dialogue, what I sometimes call the radio station of the narrative self, 
Probably is broadcasting. That's okay. Quite fascinating. But you don't need to emphasize it as much as usual. And if you notice that you are getting entangled, carried away, let's make this little shift again. Uh, letting go into the depth of your inner life, into your body, back to the belly or to your hands, to the breath. I'm breathing, I'm alive. Past exists only in thoughts, future exists only in thoughts. And then I invite you more consciously to step into the sacred space of our meeting, of our virtual temple, as a Sangha. And maybe your body remembers when it, how it feels when it steps into sacred spaces, into your favorite retreat center or church or places of pilgrimage. A sense that you are surrounded by something bigger than you. Surrounded by the divine, the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And if it helps you to call upon the presence of unconditioned love or the light of wisdom, if it helps you to shortly and lightly connect with images of a soul in a Dalai Lama, Lama Sopa Rinpoche, Lama Yeshe, Buddha, Tara, mentors, Buddhist or non-Buddhist. So let's call upon these, these sattva angels. And you call upon yours, but you do call upon them for all of us. You feel the loving gaze for all of us. Maybe you hear the voice for all of us. Maybe there's even a touch. And something in you relaxes. Uh, 
How does it feel to be seen and loved, accepted, welcomed? without condition. And resting. Bathing as if you would bathe in the morning sun after a cold night. Every cell of your body opens like a flower in the morning sun. Particularly there where you are hard with yourself or dissatisfied, ashamed. If you allow this moment to be as best as you can, you might become aware of a spaciousness or a vastness, a stillness surrounding and pervading your experience. And you can fall deeper. And whatever you meet, any discomfort or attention, you just hold softly and touch gently. Not doing anything. Just the healing capacity of witnessing with kindness. Supported by the loving gaze. Of Tara, the Buddha, Jesus. And do it for all of us.
in this sacred space where you are safe. returning and resting. How do you feel? What are you experiencing? And then uh, towards the end of our quiet sitting, I would like to invite you to look towards the inner voice. inner voices. You look towards your inner voices and you ask, who is talking there? Who is speaking? It's, if you, if you never have done that, it's, it's a bit, Frustrating, maybe. But try. It's like taking a backward step and looking at this voice. Sometimes when you look there, then nothing comes. That's also interesting. But you look there and you ask yourself, who's talking? Not looking for an answer in the conceptual mind, but just wait. Who's talking there? If you have a sense, I am talking, then who is listening? Are there two? The one who's talking and the one who's listening. On which one are you? 
the one who's talking or the one who's listening. So as soon as a thought appears which contains words, who, who is talking? Who's talking there? There might be an inst instinct answer, yes, of course, I'm talking. But then who is listening? You pay attention to inner, inner voice. Sometimes it disappears, it becomes very quiet. You just rest there. But then for sure there comes a thought, some commentary. And who is talking? And who is listening? And if this is confusing for you or frustrating, you make a backward step. Who is confused? Who feels from the frustration? Then you rest. Then sliding out of the meditation, maybe by starting to move your body, at one point your eyes open, without a sense that now the meditation is finished. Will you stay somewhat connected with the emotional body, energy body, your heart? And keeping a sense that you're in a sacred space, in a blessed space, in a blessed space.
So this uh, little self-inquiry meditation we did at the end of of our first meditation. And we will uh, explore uh, different kinds of self-inquiry. That's a little beautiful question, uh, which you can also apply, uh, you know, in your own meditation practice, maybe at the end or uh, but also, uh, it's something beautiful to apply in daily life, particularly when that voice is very nagging. Yeah. Um, it's really helpful to get a sense of the inner judge and inner critic, you know, this, this voice inside which comments everything you do or, or don't do or uh, and uh, to, to discover this uh, surprise uh, that you can actually look at it as something you are aware of. And you can just ask, who is talking there? The thing with this uh, self inquiry question, they are not meant to bring us into the conceptual mind, like, you know, looking up what we know about psychology or something like that. It's, it's more the looking. So it's, it's the looking and not being able to answer that question. So it's, it's one of these little um, uh, questions or interventions which help us, might help us to get a bit of confused about I, about me. Am I the, am I, am I the one who speaks or am I the one who is listening? There might be a sense that you are both, yeah, but that's not possible. You are either the listener or the speaker. Is there a speaker? Is there a listener? That's what we want to find out by looking. And if you get really confused then, that's very good. Confusion uh, is, is much better than uh, being sure. And uh, if you get into the questions like, question like this, like with a bit of passion also, maybe this question is not the one which uh, is working for you or is attracting you, maybe it is. So I will come up with a lot of those kind of questions in the next uh, year. Uh, but then you can, uh, you know, really uh, get into it. If you if you get a self inquiry question, which really like, and it's uh, it, it's a similar practice like the koan practice in the Zen tradition. Yeah. So you really get into it. Yeah, so if you have questions, then just raise your hand or you write in the chat. And then at the end, I leave also some space. So the first uh, tool, or uh, let's call it a tool, I would like to share with you is uh, called the four point analysis from Lama Tsongkhapa. And in the book, His Holiness starts with what is called the king of reasoning, uh, dependent arising, but I want to uh, keep that for a bit later. So 
I want to go into the four point analysis, the seven points of Chandakirti, and what is called the diamond sliver, and then the king of reasoning. Uh, and also, um, in between, like I did now, um, into this kind of self inquiry, koan like uh, questioning. And I would like to start to read uh, a quote from Lama Yeshe. And then, uh, so the, in the book, uh, How to See You As You Really Are, that's uh, the chapter 10. You, you don't need to look it up now. Uh, as I said yesterday, I, I want to uh, make a Facebook group. So I'm going to do that the next few days uh, where I, I don't know, maybe I can send the link then to Jennifer or to Sh Shaila, uh, and then they can send it out to you. You can join and I will post the quotes I'm using and the questions I'm using, I will post them. So, uh, so better now just listen and then you don't, you don't need to write things down. So uh, I will uh, put these uh, quotes I'm using into the into the Facebook group and you can then look them up and ask questions there. So the quote I want to read from Lama Yeshe kind of summarize, summarizes this uh, um, four point analysis, what is called four, four point analysis. And it's from his book, Introduction to Tantra, from a chapter called Ego Grasping and Insecurity. So Lama Yeshe says, not only are the things outside ourselves empty of the solid objective reality we project onto them. So yesterday I already said, uh, for now I want to uh, uh, pretend that uh, there is an outside reality, yeah? So, the, so within the twofold emptiness, we are going to look at the emptiness of the self and we, we leave the, the rest uh, untouched for now, yeah? So, but here Lama Yesha first states, not only are the things outside our, ourselves empty of a solid objective reality we project onto them, you check, just check around you, yeah, including your body. Probably there is a sense that you are somewhere inside here, and you look at the world, which seems to be solid and objective, out there, independent from you. Right? That's usually. the way we walk through our day. We might even have a sense that it's made out of atoms. It's solid, it's real, and it can be described objectively. Even if we know already, I mean, everyone of, no, I think everyone of us knows that that's not the case. I mean, if you have, if, if you have any recent and recent means the last 100 year, uh, 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 insight into physics, then it, it's quite obvious that it, that is not the case. So right now, when you look around, you are completely mistaken. Nothing which your eyes falls upon exist in the way it appears to you. That doesn't say it doesn't exist. Right? It doesn't exist in the way it appears to you. How does it appear? Solid objective reality. That's how it appears. And it doesn't appear as, as if we uh, 
project this solidness and this objective reality onto it. But it doesn't appear like that. But we will go into that later. The same is true for our inner sense of self. So this is a good word, a good word to kind of get uh, used to it, the sense of self, the sense of self. Because that's something we need to target, you know? So that's the sense of self. What, what is meant with these words, the sense of self? That, that's, in the four-point analysis, that's the first step. And today we were, I'm talking only about the first step in the four-point analysis. So the sense of self. What's the sense of self? For me. For you. We instinctively feel the, that we exist as, as something very real, definite, and, and substantial. So instinctively, it's an instinct. And uh, according to the teachings, that instinct is innate, it's inborn. We are born with that instinct. So we are born with that instinct and then of course we acquire more confusion throughout our life. So there is that innate instinctive confusion and then there's this acquired confusion, depending on our language, on our culture, and on our belief systems. And both are important in this exploration. So we increase our awareness of what are my belief system about the self? Maybe you have like a belief system of a kind of higher self or soul, or uh, maybe you have like, you know, if you come from like Advaita Vedanta non-duality, then you have maybe something like I am awareness or something like this. So uh, so this, uh, you know, this uh, Prasankika Madhyamika school, which is, what we're exploring here. It's one of the four major philosophical schools in, in Buddhism, according to the Tibetan system, is, is more radical than Advaita Vedanta. Yeah. So you, you might have a sense, yeah, it's all consciousness and I am that or, or something like that. So what, what's your, so that's, that's helpful to become aware of it of that acquired. What belongs also to the acquired is all the roles you, uh, you have adapted. Mm -hmm. Like me, the mother, me, the professional, uh, me, the wife, me, the husband. Yeah, so these acquired roles, they, they, are, they become part of the sense of me. And uh, the, the, the innate, the instinctual sense of self, that's something more subtle. It's an, it's an energetic contraction in your whole system. And it's a, it's a contraction of your subtle energy body and it's, it's experiential. We particular uh, feel it uh, like when we are criticized, for example. So that contraction, but that contraction is actually there all the time. So even right now, you might be quite relaxed and you feel well, or when you meditate, it's more spacious. There's probably still like a sense of a contraction, like of a core. And even if you have like experience of I'm not the content of my experience. I am the witness. I'm the observer. That's, there's still an eye there. There's still a kind of 
place from where you're looking. It's a very subtle level of this instinctual, instinctual confusion. So we instinctively, instinctively feel that we exist as something very real, definite, and, some, and substantial. So that is called the object of refutation, the object of negation. The Tibetan word for that is gaksha. Maybe helpful to know, gaksha. The sense of self. Very real, definite, and substantial. That's the object of refutation. The object of negation. That is what we are targeting. So when Lama Tsongkhapa says that this, uh, to identify the target, and that's why I don't want to talk about anything else today, and the homework then is to identify the target. So that's a little bit like an analogy is, so you have a house and you're convinced there is a thief in the house. So the, the house is symbolizing what is called the five aggregates. Yeah? So the, it's the rooms where you're looking for. And we, do, we don't need to know what the five aggregates it is. Just, you know, it's just uh, five boxes uh, describing the body-mind complex, yeah? like differentiating. So obviously, if there is an eye, then where the, the place where the house where we look uh, is the five aggregates, why is the body mind, the, the system of the body mind. So imagine a house, it's your house, and you have a sense that the thief in it. So you want to check the house. And that's exactly what you do in the five point, point analysis you check the house. And in the system of the five aggregates, there's five rooms there. Yeah. Um, you could also use the 51 mental factors or in one room is 51 uh, growers, yeah? And you need to all open them and, and you look. So, but, in order to do that, in order to exclude really in your own experience that there is no thief in the house, you need to have an idea of what the thief is. Otherwise, you look and if you don't have an idea what a thief is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to say at the end in the search of the house, there is no thief in the house. So we need to have uh, an experience, first an understanding, but then an experience of what is the thief in this house, in my house. And initially it's easy to kind of not appreciate the severity of the damage of this thief, which we are looking for. You know, it's easy to think, oh, this is philosophy. I, the, the, he's just believing in this. I need to believe this. And what has it to do with my life? Yeah. So it, it's easy to kind of uh, not appreciate and also not directly experience that it is actually the thief in your house which is causing your struggle, which is causing this, for some people, this constant sense of being uncomfortable on, under your own skin, uncomfortable in your life. A feeling of that you're not good enough, 
right? you need to work hard and so on and so on and so on. And all reactivity, all defensiveness, all worries, are caused by the thief in the house. Of course you want to know who is the thief. I mean, an, a real thief in your house can just, can just steal some things. Uh, but this thief does cause amazing damage. So you really want to know what the thief is. And then you look. You look into the you look into the rooms, and the looking then happens in the in the third in the other steps. Yeah. So we are in the first step, identifying the object of refutation. This is also important to identify the object of refutation. Uh, so one one possible. Uh, outcome if you don't identify the object of reputation is that you don't hit the target. The other uh, possible trap here is to, uh, to refute too much, to negate too much. Yeah? To come to a conclusion like, yeah, okay, I don't exist, so nothing matters or something like that. I, I don't see the danger so much, uh, you know, for us, but um, because it's, I mean, we live in relationships. Some of you have children. I mean, to say I don't exist, it's just like, it doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, but it could be, it could be that, that uh, if we're not clear of what you're refuting, why, it's also about really understanding what is actually meant by self in the no self. What is really meant by that? So we are not talking about that there's no personality or that there's no habits and there's no addiction and there's no feelings. And so all that is, all that is not the thief. And all that remains untouched for now. All that, in a way, you could say is real. But for now, what we say, what, the only thing here, what is not real, is the thief. He is imagined. He is an hallucination. She is an hallucination. She is, an, she is a projection. She is made up. She exists, as Lama Sopa says, merely labeled or in name only. She does not exist. And this is not a philosophy. It's not a belief. It is a fact. It is like that. And the way to find out is to look for the thief in the house and find out yourself. And to be really thorough in that res research, really, really passionate. I mean, if you, if you have a thief in the house, you go to the basement, you go to the attic, you open every, 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 uh, every cupboard. And then there is this relief. Ah. Oh. I just made it up. It was a paranoia. There is no thief. So we have no doubt about this real me. And it seems absurd to think of it as just another hallucination. And notice that in you. If there comes this, this is absurd. 
and I'm not going to listen to this. This is so absurd. What is he talking about? What are they talking about? It's me. I'm here. How can we, how can anyone question that? I know that uh, that's me. It was me yesterday. It was me last week. It was me who lost my job a year ago. It was me who went to a divorce 10 years ago. It's me. It's absurd to question that. And it is the case that some people, they turn away at this moment. Or something in them says, oh, this is philosophy. It's so complicated. And you need to read all these books. I'm too stupid for this. I do some mindfulness of breathing and being aware of my feelings. And that's the level where I stay. But it's not complicated. And none of us is, uh, is uh, too stupid to, uh, to do this. But there might be a voice like that. Because it is confusing initially. It is confusing and challenging to be questioned in the very sense of what was always there, me the center of the universe, the most important me. The me which, is, which then is causing this really troublemaker word, and that's mine, yeah? If there's no me, there, there's, there's no mine. Mine relies on me, the sense of me. So, and then he says, yet, if we take the trouble to search for this supposedly concrete I or me, we will discover that we cannot find it anywhere. So, in this steps of looking, that's then the third, the second, third, and fourth step of the analysis, the sense of looking. So, and the sense of looking needs to come from a sense of passion and compassion. Passion, I mean, like, you need to do it as if your life depends on it, and it does. It has to become an obsession. And not only for a week. Uh, for some people, it might take a few years. Even. And then, then it gets really difficult because, you know, you have you have done your studies and you know you you know and and now even the, the i mean the result is it, it says even here in the like in the most uh, introduction uh words of lama yeje into this topic then he says you know we cannot find it anywhere so yeah so you might then in that case so i, uh, I you cannot find it anywhere then in that case, you might not really thoroughly check your house for the thief, you know, because you know that everyone, including, I mean, every Buddhist teacher from all traditions, I mean, everyone, and, and not only Buddhist teachers, they say to you, you cannot find it anywhere. So why to look? You could stay in front of the house and say, yeah, in this book, it says there is no thief in the house. So I can relax. I don't need to look. I don't need to do the looking. Yeah? But then that there is no thief in the house remains a, a, a thought. And, and the thought doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, start to dissolve the instinctual sense of me. It helps a bit with the acquired stuff, you know, 
It's, it's like a belief. And uh, many people get stuck there. Yeah. Then the, depending also uh, if you have an inclination to kind of academic studies, uh, then you then and you hear yeah, first you need to study this and the four philosophical schools and there's so many different definitions, the different schools they define the self differently and and then you go into that for years and years and years and you don't look you stand in in front of your house and you read all these books that there's no thieves and there's this thief and, and that thief and some people say the thief looks like this and other people look say the thief looks like that and and so on and so on. and you're standing in front of your house and you're reading books about thieves yeah and you never go inside and look So I think, I mean, this is a bit heretical to say, but I think even if you have like a half-baked understanding, you know, from any of the schools, or if, if it's Theravada, it doesn't matter. If you have any kind of uh, understanding of what the thief is, go into the house and look with that. And then you go outside again and read the books, and then maybe you can refine your understanding of the thief. And yeah, but right from the beginning, go into the house and look. And work with the sense of self you have. And then slowly, slowly you you make it more and more subtle. So, and then he, he starts a bit. So I, I just read the beginning. Neither our head or arm or leg nor any other part of the body is our eye. Yeah, so that's, that's starting to look into the room of the, into the rooms of the five aggregates. So we look into the body and then he says the, sa the same is true for, of our mind. None of our countless thoughts or feelings that continually arise and disappear is the real me, yeah, and so on. So, and then, um, so you, you search the house for the thief and you don't find the thief because there is no thief. There never was a thief. There was a merely labeled, in mere name existing thief. Yeah, so that that's something which is there because that's what we suffer from. But it's not real, it's not findable. It's just a thought. Ramayisha uses the word hallucination. It's a hallucination something extra, we project into the house. So, this, when we, if we want to describe the thief, yeah, so there's three characteristics. And the first one is it's unified, it's unitary, it's, it's one thing. Yeah. Maybe you get a sense of that, the sense of me, no, yeah. Now, you all have this experience of shifting roles, yeah? Like, uh, no, let's say, imagine, you know, you are grown up and you have a job and you feel quite, you know, so you, so you are kind of grown up and then you go home 
And somehow your parents managed to make you five years old. Yeah. So there is the professional I, and then there is the five years old I, and somehow your parents have managed to make you regress into that. Yeah? You feel like that, you become like that again. Or so you completely changed, but because your parents don't see it like that, they see you as they always saw you. So and somehow that projection on their side makes you regress into that. But nevertheless, you still have the sense, both is me. There's one me. You don't have a sense that you are a family. By the way, the internal family systems therapy is like, you know, the, the it, it's like, I mean, it's not, it, it's not the most profound level, but it helps us, you know, to just start to question this idea that there is a solid me, a unitary me. So if you start to uh, experience yourself as a as a um, as a family, as a team, as a Alex Burson calls it as a transitory network of many different things a transitory network, always changing, always assuming different roles, all, always uh, feeling uh, and responding differently. So if you experience yourself as that, that's, that's one of the steps. That's closer to truth. That's closer to how you really exist. As a transitory network, as a process, and this process is actually open. It's not closed. It's not like it's an open process, like the weather is an open process, connected with not only what is happening here on Earth, but you know, with the sun and the moon and you know, the whole solar system is part of the of, is part of this network of weather. So that's one characteristic, this unitary, this it's one. You're looking for the one, unified me. The second characteristic is it's lasting. It doesn't change. So that could be connected with the experience you might have that it was me who got up this morning and it's the same me which is now sitting here and listening, it's me. It's the same me. It, it could be even that you have a sense that what happened 20 years ago in your life, you know, someone criticized you and you still hold a grudge towards that person because he criticized me. It's, and it's the me which was there then and you can still suffer from that criticism and hold a grudge because he criticized the same me which is now here. That's the lasting me. It doesn't change. One of the uh, insights here which helps us to relax that a bit is the insight into impermanence. You know? So that's, it's, it's not the insight into emptiness, but it's a stepping stone, the insight into anicca, three of the insights you have in Vipassana meditation. First deep insight, that everything is impermanent. Everything is changing moment by moment. How could there be a me, a solid separate me, if everything is changing, a lasting me, if everything is changing, when there is nothing solid inside of you or around you. Nothing is the same as it was when we start our set, our, our, our session. This moment, including this body, including your mind, including your feeling, including your thoughts, nothing is the same. So that's the last lasting sometimes called permanent. It's not changing. 
So this is the idea also uh, from a Buddhist point of view, a mistaken view on rebirth or reincarnation. They you know there is systems of systems which say there is like a, a soul or an eye and it jumps from life to life. from hour to hour, from, from day to day, from month to month, from year to year, from decade to decade, from life to life. That's the lasting eye. And the third characteristic is, it exists independently from thought. It exists independently from label, from mind. It exists separately, inherently, self-powered, out of itself. So they, these are the three characteristics of the I, which, which we target. It's unitary, it's lasting, and it's at, and it, it exists inherently, inherently, self-powered, out of itself, independent from a mind, making it. Or in other words, it's not a projection, it's not a hallucination, it's not just a thought. It's findable. That's how it feels. It's something we we would find if we would look. Like we can find a cup or a cupboard. So in the, in the book, chapter 10, uh, you find, um, I think five or six different uh, reflections uh, which are meant to uh, make that sense of I, the sense of me, more obvious to you. So these are different scenarios. Yeah? For example, imagining that you're criticized, imagining that you, uh, you lose something, uh, imagining that you're praised, uh, and so on and so on. So, and that's, that's what, if you would go through a kind of traditional reflection on this, that would be the first step. So the, you would um, kind of enhance or like intensify the experience of the sense of me uh, through this kind of scenarios. Fortunately, our daily life is just one scenario after another, yeah? So, um, and that's, in this case, it's beautiful because, um, you know, if, you're, if you live in a relationship, if you have children, if you have colleagues, friends, they are in your life to trigger you. Particularly your partner. That's the main job of the partner to trigger you. At least you can see it like that, you know? And so, so the, to identify the object of negation can become a daily practice right there on the spot. Just observing this continuum. Yeah? So sometimes it's very relaxed like when you meditate or you're in nature. And sometimes it's very obvious, me. How dare you, you, especially you, to say this to me. Yeah, so that me, that, you become aware of that. And then it's and a happy occasion. You become kind of curious about 
situations and moments where you feel triggered, when you feel defensive, when you want to hold up a certain image, when all kinds of uh, social anxiety, you know? so we all have a continuum of that. Obviously. But some people, they can't be relaxed at all, never. This is like an exaggeration, but when they are around anyone. And then most of us, we know, we have people we feel comfortable with, and but there's probably also people in your life who make you somehow shrink, where you feel uncomfortable, where you feel like hiding, where you feel not comfortable under your own skin, where you feel you're not good enough, something like that. So, and that's then a moment of just pausing and feeling that. How does the I appear to me? And not doing anything. So in the first step, it's just about that. Just being curious about how the me appears to me, the I. Yeah, so is there any question? I didn't leave, sorry, I didn't leave so much time for that. I get carried away with this topic because, I mean, this is it for now, you know? Uh, the long term, uh, the long term goal is enlightenment, you know. But uh, I'm not so sure about that. You know, they say it takes like three great eons or something like that. Uh, but to uh, radically uh, shift my the level of social anxiety and concerns of what other people think about me and so on and so on, that would be already something. And then we and then we do the rest lighter, you know, the, the rest of the path. We do it lighter. We travel lighter without I. Yeah. That's a good question. When, when the me dissolves, it doesn't dissolve because it doesn't exist. So nothing dissolves. Yeah? The ego does not dissolve or we don't need to overcome the ego or something like that. It doesn't exist. Yeah? But I, I, I get it. Yeah? Uh, if I had a sense of a greater con connection, is that it? Yes. It, it depends of what, what kind of hat I'm wearing. Uh, I, I, I would need to give different answers to that question. <laughs> I mean, uh, kind of secretly, I'm still a yoga shaka from my own experience. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, of course, not from my, like, what I would think philosophically, but um, um, so I think uh, for now, it's good to uh, not answer that question. And that's the, that's what, you know, that's the, in general in the Galuk tradition, uh, not everyone, but uh, most uh, most teachers would not answer that question. They wouldn't say something like, yeah, then there is connectedness. And uh, so here in this um, approach, uh, the emptiness or the, the voidness, which then opens is non-affirmative, they say. It's non-affirmative, what it means it's not replaced by 
consciousness or God or I am bad or uh, so it's it, it, so it's non-affirmative. You don't find the I, and that's it. But maybe I can say there is not nothing. <laughs> there is not nothing. Experientially, for many people, it, it, the experience, if you then would want to describe it or you want to kind of explain to yourself or others what you just experienced, you, you, might, you might say something like unconditioned love or I'm nothing that's emptiness and I'm everything that's love or something like that. So that, that's experiential. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday I talked a bit uh, about the importance of devotion and having a teacher like that um, in um, But it seems there's some people who fall into no self. No, without uh, that kind of connections. It definitely helps, time tested, to have, uh, to have a teacher. Okay, so the Lama, uh, Lama Sopa sometimes says uh, the, the most powerful way to, if, you, if you're into this, you know, acclimate merit and purify. So I say it now in a traditional way. Um, the best way to do that is to reflect and meditate on empathy. This is more powerful than, uh, you know, all the other stuff we could do. So this is really amazing that in all of us, there is some curiosity and some interest to explore this. It's so powerful. Even starting to doubt that you exist in the way you believe is so powerful, so precious. So the, the positivity of this meeting is like, like a, a blast of light into, uh, into, into, uh, into the cosmos. This is our hope. Yeah, this is our hope. This is the hope for the planet a shift in human consciousness. It's absolutely necessary. Okay, yeah, Pat, you wanted to say something? Oh, Amy has her hand up. I don't know if we have time uh, for- a, No, a, maybe, a uh, no, I think we stop. Then. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, I have another teaching. Ah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I will make the Facebook group uh, and then you will get an invitation for that and then I will post the quote I read today and then we can also ask questions there. Uh, sometimes you know, 
sometimes people get a bit active, sometimes not. So let's see. Yeah, and then, yeah, I see you soon again, end of February. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Stefan. Bye. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.